Good afternoon, and welcome to um, this uh, conversation, front course conversation, uh, co uh, sponsored and hosted by the American Enterprise Institute and the Brookings Institution. My name is Brent Orell. I'm a senior fellow here at AEI. I focus most of my time and attention on workforce development, uh, including workforce development for people and communities outside our major metropolitan areas. For those of you who are not familiar with AEI, we are a nonprofit public policy research institution dedicated to defending, to defending human dignity, expanding human potential, and building a freer and safer world. The work of our scholars and staff advances ideas rooted in our belief in democracy, free enterprise, American strength and global leadership, solidarity with those at the periphery of our society and a pluralistic entrepreneurial culture. I'm joined today uh, by my uh, friend and colleague uh, from the Brookings Institution, Tony Pippa. Tony is a senior fellow in the Center for Sustainable Development at the Brookings Institution he, ha he launched and leads the Reimagining Rural Policy Initiative at Brookings, which seeks to modernize and transform U.S. rural policy. Uh, and he also hosts an excellent podcast uh, called Reimagine Rural, which I recommend for your listening uh, and your edification about issues relating to rural America. Our guest is Nick Jacobs, and he is a political scientist and professor at Colby College, I believe that's in Maine. Uh, he writes about federalism, rural politics, and public policy, and has published numerous journals, in, in, is published in numerous journals, including Perspectives on Politics, Political Science Quarterly, Publius, the Journal of Federalism, Presidential Studies Quarterly, and Political Research Quarterly. And he's the author of our uh, the book that we're discussing today, The Rural Voter. Uh, contemporary differences between rural and urban America have their roots in, in long-term demographic, economic, technological, and social factors. In this new event series uh, that uh, Brookings and AEI are um, co-sponsoring, I'm joining with Tony Pippa to host a series of conversations on the front porch with authors of recent research on the past and future of rural America. These discussions will explore the unique challenges and opportunities uh, facing rural America and consider policy options to promote development and opportunity outside the nation's major metropolitan areas. So with that, uh, I would like to turn, the, um, turn this conversation over to Tony, uh, and he's gonna get us started with the first question. Uh, and we expect this to be very free flowing and we expect and hope that you, the audience will be participating. If you would like to submit a question, you can submit it to David Veldrin at AEI.org. That's David.Veldrin, V-E-L-D-R-A-N at AEI.org or on Twitter or X uh, with the hashtag on the front porch. So, uh, Tony, go ahead and get us started. Thanks, Brent. And uh, before we get into the conversation, I just want to say um, thank you and deep appreciation for you, uh, for your willingness to partner on this and for joining us, joining me on the front porch and look forward to this and, and subsequent conversations and to AEI uh, for their partnership and for hosting this first conversation. Uh, rural America is a vast, diverse, interesting, and unique place, and I'm really looking forward to the opportunity that we'll have together to talk to a lot of different people who have been thinking deeply about rural America, what it means to the country, um, what's been happening there, and for us to explore that together over these next uh, months and weeks. Um, and I'm really pleased uh, to start us off this conversation with Nick. Um, and uh, even to get us started um, on this book, which is called The Rural Voter, where you and Dan Shea, your co-author, have, I think, collected maybe some of the most exhaustive data that there is on voters uh, in rural America. But before we get into some of that substance, Nick, it would just be great to hear from you why this book? 
what was the motivation? What what prompted you and Dan to take on this issue? And what were what were the questions that you were asking yourself? Uh, and then I think it would be good also to talk a little bit about just in very broad terms um, some of the con some of the conclusions, and then we can back up and and how you got there. But why this book? Yeah. Well, first I'll I'll start by. You know, just going around again and, and thanking Brookings and AI for, for hosting me. Uh, I wish we could be getting together on our, our actual front porch, but getting in the office in, in uh, rural Maine this morning presented its own set of challenges, let alone down to D.C. So, yeah, why this book? Uh, Dan and I certainly aren't the only ones thinking about rural America, uh, certainly not with the upcoming election this November. Um Lots of people have had their minds on this segment of the electorate, about 18, 20% of the American electorate, especially since 2016, um, when not, not only because of rural voters, but because of large switches in rural voting trends in certain parts of the country, uh, Donald Trump was able to win certain states uh, in the upper Midwest along the Democrats' blue wall um, and capture the Electoral College. And I think that drew a lot of people's attention to this part of America, to this group of Americans. And for at least four years, now longer, we heard no shortage of explanations as to why this man was so popular among these people. And Dan and I, who are both scholars of related fields, political geography, political parties, I think we're motivated first and foremost by the fact that we are those people. <laughs> and if not just because of a chip on our shoulder that a lot of the writing about rural peoples and rural politics was being done by people that we're stopping by for a weekend and interviewing rural people and maybe not deeply embedded in the community, or just a tendency to simplify and tell a salacious story about the guy that drives around the town with a giant Trump flag in his uh, pickup truck. W you know, we we sense that the story was not being told with enough nuance. We knew that scholars out there who we're deeply indebted to and scholars that we've worked with for a number of years were trying to tell that nuanced story. People like Kathy Kramer, people like Arlie Hochschild, and a lot of, no offense, a lot of people in policy communities, a lot of people um, that were reading those stories didn't find them, uh, didn't take them serious enough, maybe because of their method, maybe because they were doing more ethnographic work, not quantitative analysis. And so Dan and I felt that we could contribute to that uh, corrective, as it were, really trying to understand um, who the rural voter was, not just a, a segment of rural voters that turn out and, and or actually talk to journalists, what motivates rural voters, trying to tease out some of the competing explanations that we've seen over the last couple of years, especially around racial animus versus economic dislocation. Uh, and that led us to, as you said, conduct what I think we haven't gotten any pushback on it. We believe is the largest survey of rural voters ever conducted in, in, for a single study, upwards of 10,000 across the United States. Uh, All right. Well, thank Well, um, and you are in rural places, like just. Give me a little sense of what you're from. What, what do you look out when you're looking when you're on your front porch? What are you looking at? Well, uh, in addition to the ice storm that hit us last night and kind of complicated the sitting on my front porch, front porch because there's an ice dam I haven't taken care of in a while. Uh, usually, when I I try not to do these things from home because my internet goes down or my rooster starts crowing. <laughs> <laughs> so I call the great small town of Vassaboro, Maine, home. And uh, Vassaboro is particularly unique for this study because it is one of those towns. It is one of those towns that Barack Obama wins in two thousand eight and Donald Trump wins in two thousand and sixteen. Um, I try not to extrapolate too much uh, from from rural Maine and rural New England, 
Um, but there are parts of parts of it that uh, typify the rural experience. Um, yeah, I, I look out on beautiful country. I never thought I'd call Maine home. I was born and raised in Virginia, but. <laughs> Well, and I say some of that, you know, somewhat facetiously, but also authentically, because I think one of the things that even on the work that, you know, I've been doing on rural policy, I think credibility and trust with folks who live in rural America is is important to them. They need to feel as if, uh, you know, the people who are talking about them um, sort of understand and are connected. And uh, I think it's it's good not just to have the data that you're talking about and that we'll talk about today, but also that you've you've got that you're embedded in that experience and you've got relationships with people as well um, who are in your community and around your neighborhood uh, who are rural and and um, you have that you have that background and you have that uh, to sort of keep us grounded as well. I would say. I remember when I moved to, to Vassabora, I was getting my car registered. And the guy in front of me in line is talking to the town clerk. And he says, now, I know I'm the new person on the street and I can't complain. But for the last 40 years, we've seen people speeding on this road. Can we please get a speed? <laughs> and, and, you know, I know that's typical of many rural communities. I, I appreciate you acknowledging in that. Uh, I, I will say at the outset, I, I never try to, to speak on behalf of rural people. Uh, if one of the most important things that I hope people take away from this book is that, you know, although although there is a rural America and we, and we can think about a rural America as a whole, one of the things rural Americans care the most about is their particular part of that mm. whole. And uh, the last person you would probably hear say the word rural America is living out here in rural America. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I'd like to jump in on that on that particular um, point. Um, not so. You've met one rural American. You've met one rural American. You've been in one rural American community. You've been in one rural American community. Like we, it's very very difficult to generalize across these things, across uh, people and across um, communities. Now, from a social science standpoint, you can collect the data and you can get to that level of generalization, at least in some ways. I'm really curious um, what your research tells you about change um, in perspectives and attitudes uh, around the kinds of issues that um, are particularly motivating for people living in rural areas. What does the what does the data show us about how rural America, say, was 20 years ago or 40 years ago as compared to where the way it is today. Right. So and I mean I, and, and and you're right. This is this is I I don't know if it's a formal paradox, but it is something I, I am constantly thinking about among a people that care so deeply about place, about their local community. Um why is it? Like, why does it make sense to speak of them in sort of a nationalist whole? Um, and one of the reasons, though, is, is that empirically, right, observationally, even if people are, even if rural people throughout the country might have their minds fixed on the local or, or on the regional, um, they are moving kind of in similar patterns, right? So the first thing that comes to mind when thinking about what's changed um, and this this is just a data point that I, I was constantly, Dan and I were constantly thinking about throughout writing the book, is that in the 1970s, rural Americans, so Americans living in rural places, were among the most likely to trust one another or to trust other people, to trust the federal government, to trust federal government institutions, and today they are the least. And that has gone hand in hand with general declines in social and political trust across the country. But it has been greatest among individuals living in rural communities. So, so are you saying that that's that loss of trust is true at kind of a institutional level and at the community level among people who are living in the same communities? There's been a decline in trust 
among them? You're anticipating my next paper. Okay, sorry, Be sorry. Because the way we get the so uh, I can't go back to that. That sorry for the wonky like measurement question. Fifteen minutes in our <laughs> response, <laughs> but I can't go back to the 1970s General Social Survey and change the way that they ask uh, about social trust. My argument is that it's a little bit vague. It's about people in general. Um, Whereas I, I, there's evidence um, that we present in the book, there's evidence that other scholars, that social trust within rural communities remains rather high still. But, and a lot of, you know, so you could think, how do you reconcile these? The people, you know, can you trust other people generally is how we ask the question. Well, it's the other people living over there, not the people living with me. So uh, it is a frontier of research I'm working on. Somebody can beat me to it. Um, the, it. On the general change that I was describing, you know, either way, the political trust, we know who the outgroup there is. It's, it's the federal government. It's the specific federal institutions that we ask about. It's even things like uh, medical field. Again, trust is problematic throughout American society. It's been declining since the 1960s, but nowhere has that drop off been as great than in rural America. And I think that goes hand in hand with all these other demographic and economic and societal changes um, that, that viewers and, and certainly the two of you know about, but it, in some ways it all comes back to trust. So let me push on that because you talked about the federal government. Um, is it trust about government writ large? In fact, government is sometimes, uh, in this day and age, uh, in some rural economies, a pretty big part of a local economy, especially if we're including schools and hospitals. Um, but even county governments and, and local governments can sometimes play a pretty important employment role. Yeah. Um, is that trust about government in any shape or form, or is it primarily that 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 distrust uh, directed at the federal government and the federal agencies? Is there is there a way to be able to parse that? Yeah, we do parse it. I parse it out in some other work, not in the in the book. Um, it's a it's a great question, and the the, the simplest answer is that no government is more disliked than the government in Washington D.C. That probably doesn't surprise most people, right? It may be for policy reasons, maybe because uh, the, the the they're the most visible, and when people think about government and people's day to day lives, even if it's not the most impactful. Um, but we do know that state and local governments, even in the context that you described, Tony, are not immune from drawing this sort of criticism. And, you know, one of the important findings from other more sociological oriented work uh, towards a local and state government is that state's Department of Environmental Protection are particularly noxious to segments of rural communities. Um, and even teachers, and, and we find evidence for this in our own rural voter survey, even teachers are viewed um, more negatively in, in segments of the rural population than they are in the suburban and urban populations. A lot of that is, I think, wrapped up. My wife is a teacher. I was a former public school teacher. This is a very unfair I, I think a statement, but a lot of it is wrapped up in the idea that this is not a hard working group of individuals, or maybe that this is not a group of individuals that are as economically vulnerable as those that do not work for government, right? They are among a privileged group of individuals who more or less have a have a job guarantee in, uh, in, in certain parts of the economy that are extremely volatile where nothing can be taken for, for granted. And, and just following up on that, to to your point, you described some changes in reaction to Brent's, Brent's question um, about how that voting block has changed since the 70s. Um, so why are what what does your research point to as some of the reasons for that change? What what are things happening that have you know created that distrust with the federal government? What are some of the things that uh, Rural people have experienced um, that have led that led to that to that place. 
So summarizing about 480. Yeah, I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that, actually. That's good. Uh, I have it right in front of me here. Yeah, it's over yeah. 400. Uh... <laughs> no, well, I don't think there's one thing. And I know that's sort of a academic's cop out. But when we're talking, a, when we're trying to correct a a storyline or a narrative about rural voters that has tried to boil it down to one thing. It's racial animus. Uh, it's them being duped by savvy conservative operatives. Uh, it's Christian national. It's okay, I think, and it's necessary, especially for the type of work that that AEI and Brookings is, is promoting with, with, through actionable policy steps, it's necessary to say it can be many things. And I guess the, the sort of simplest way I would describe the change is that it is a little bit of a bottom-up reaction to social and economic changes, real, real changes affecting rural communities writ large. And it is a little top-down. I mean... Bottom up, this is a story of deindustrialization, offshoring, the decline of manufacturing in this country, which affects rural communities disproportionately. Rural rural America was was this country's manufacturing core. Um, the dependency on manufacturing jobs was highest in rural parts, especially the rural south, uh, in old mill towns through the northeast. Um, the, the, there's more jobs outside of the Rust Belt in rural America by the 1980s. This is also a story of agricultural consolidation in the 60s and 70s. The, the, just the fundamental restructuring, not only of the rural economy, but rural society that was defined for hundreds of years based off of a relationship with the land and small-scale agriculture that hasn't existed for two generations but these communities are still trying to deal with the collapse of those local economies, still trying to figure it out. Um, you know, we can talk about specific policies that may have made those things worse, and certainly in the minds of many rural people made it worse. Like NAFTA is a salient consideration in their mind. But you know, there there are legitimate bottom-up forces. Sorry, Brent. Oh, yeah, I was just gonna um I, I I love the point. Uh, uh, Tony and I have been talking with people who are kind of experts in the history of rural development. One of the things that I think uh, has come through pretty clear is that this isn't actually a new problem, uh, and it's it's even older than I think what you suggest. Uh, it's it's been a transition in American society that's been going on. In, since the dawn of the industrial age and the and the move from the farm to the factory um and i think it's ha i'd be interested in your perspective on this i think that we can look back at these transitions and say yep they happen and they are really stressful and they foment a lot of discord within society as change um uh as as change occurs uh, and, and it's remarkably consistent, the concerns they get raised. If you look at the 1920s, you know, we had a huge upsurge uh, after the First World War in kind of anti-immigrant uh, 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 religious conflict over religious beliefs uh, that, that created a lot of turmoil in American society. And that was, of course you know, in part the product of this change that was going on. I mean, is that, do you, you're nodding. So I, I assume that you agree to, to, some, to some degree with what I'm saying, but what's your perspective on the cyclical nature of this, uh, of, the, of the way that this has been working? Yeah, part of me is really tempted by this, this cyclical pattern, right? History doesn't repeat itself, but it it certainly does rhyme type of you know, twain, not me, <laughs> uh, type of story. You know, one of the one of the motivations of this book, and one really the first half of the book is trying to situate this rural urban divide historically and and go all the way back to the early eighteen hundreds 
to understand whether or not the rural urban divide and partisanship that we see today is, is, is new or whether we've been there before. And there's certainly parts of our history that make me think like, oh, we've been here before. And I kind of want to tell myself that story because I want to tell myself, okay, our institutions have been stressed. They can handle it. You know, the competitive pressures induced by party competition, you know, mean that they're going to politicians are going to respond and, and, you know, the democratic system will work. And, you know, one of the periods of time you point to the 1920s, which I think is great. One one period of time that we point to in the book and and many others do is is the late 1800s where we see you know a, a full scale agrarian revolt a, a a populist movement capital P populist to distinguish it from the bad populism of today this was the good capital P populism and not to be the the pessimist in the room. But I, I think back to that period of time, and my main takeaway is that rural America remains as vulnerable and prone to exploitate political exploitation today as they were a hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago. And and by that I mean, you know, even in this moment of American history where everything seemed like we should have had this this rural rebellion, like in a good way, like rural mobilization, rural people coming together and pushing for change, na uh, mobilizing on a national scale, like my read of that history, and I'm not alone in this, and, and there's certainly other historians that have dedicated their careers to this period, my read of that is that the rural program got fully co-opted by savvy politicians. You know, if you read what rural people and what farmers put forward in the in the 1892 Omaha platform, right after after the Populist Party meets, they're talking about nationalizing the railroads. Right? They're talking about eliminating private banks, um, a, a system of federal credit. And and what do they get? They get a candidate, a great orator in 1896 by the name of William Jennings Bryan. It's like, oh, all your problems will be solved with silver. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> and and more distressing than that, you know, what I think rural people were especially good at recognizing in that time period is that the problems affecting rural people were the same problems affecting the impoverished living elsewhere. The, 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 the Omaha platform begins with more or less a statement that the enemies of rural labor and of civic labor are the same. And rather than coming together and sort of promoting this unified platform, what we see is that politicians successfully uh, drove a wedge between different communities and, and they were unable to successfully mobilize nation nationally. Now, that's all to say, you know, sorry for the <laughs> raining on the parade. That's all to say, I think what what surprised Dan, I, I was well prepared to write a book, you know, sort of saying like, okay, we've been here before, here's some lessons we can take. What Dan and I found by, by looking at voting patterns throughout, you know, the last 200 years is that never, never has the divide between rural voters and urban voters been as great as it is today. That even if you go back to that period I was just describing in the late 1800s, it pales in comparison to the rural-urban divide today. So we can actually talk about a rural voter uh, in 2016, 2020, in a way that even in the 1920s, Americans are still much more divided by their region, their occupation, uh, their race, of course. Today, the rural voting block exists. So let me ask, um, because I think one of the conventional pieces of wisdom around rural voters is that they have disproportionate power, like in, within our electoral system. Like they've, they've got, you know, because of the way, um, because of the way the electoral college is set up, because of the Senate and and other things. We have a small number of people who really have like this outsized political influence. 
Um, but when I just hear you talk um, at the beginning of our conversation and also even looking at some of the data in the book, um, and this is also my experience in working on, on policy issues in local communities, I get the sense that rural voters themselves feel like they have very little power to influence decision making in Washington, that they feel like nobody's really protecting their interests. And you talk, you just, you mentioned NAFTA, you mentioned, you know, agricultural consolidation, things like that. Um, how do we reconcile those two things? Like how, how you know, on one hand, we, we hear rural voters got all this disproportionate power, they're like running the country. But on the other hand, you know, rural people are like, nobody's going to bat for us. And we feel like, you know, decisions are getting made, policy decisions are getting made that are basically throwing us under the bus, if I want to use a, a euphemism. Um, how do you think about that? How does, what does your data say about that? What, uh, how would you talk about that? Yeah. I think this is one of the, I think this is one of the most important questions we need to be discussing because it, it, you know, your answer to that question means you're either listening to what rural people say and taking it for what they say, taking it as true, or you're just going to dismiss them and say, ah, oh, you don't know what's going on. So the way I, I be, you know, we, we dissect this in a couple of different ways throughout the book. You know, the first thing I would say is, is early on, let's just acknowledge that even if there is an institutional advantage, right? It's never set up deliberately to give rural people in 1789, 1787 an advantage because 95% of Americans at the founding are rural, right? So they, these are these are insti constitutional institutions that are sitting, uh, are, social change is sitting on top of these constitutional institutions. Um, <clears throat> so it's not like a, uh, a, a grand conspiracy on behalf of rural peoples at the time of the founding, you know, because America is rural. They're, they're, that word's actually not even thrown around a whole lot until the late 1800s because it just is. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at things like the Electoral College and Senate, um, it's it's very easy to to look at a map and to look at those vast swaths of red across the country and say, that's the rural people. That's that's where the rural people are getting their advantage. You know, Wyoming's vote counting 16 times more than the average Californian. But here's the problem. There are more rural Californians than there are in all of Wyoming, right? There's a, rural America, I think, really suffers from an analytical problem that one, they're actually a very small segment of the American population, only about 20%. So if you're trying to make a grand claim about us being in the rural cabal, you know, you've set this bar pretty high that we're being, you know, that 20% of Americans are are, dick, are pulling the levers of the 80%. Like that well, is some institutional and, advantage. And just to interrupt for a second, I mean, yeah, it's, not just, it's just not just small numbers, right? It is a question of sort of economic and cultural power within society, right? I mean, it's not just that there's 20% of the American public is living in rural America, and how can that 20% possibly govern, right? They they just they they are weak from the from just from a numbers standpoint. But when you think about when you layer on top of that the 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 non-political power that that is that they see that I think they see themselves arrayed again that is arrayed against them in terms of the media academia uh, 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 you know the economy just the the influence influence is different than political power and uh, very weak on influence I think and uh, and really when you think about those constitutional mechanisms i mean it's like the one thing that that helps to balance the the disproportionate um power of 
the coasts, the urban areas, the, the big cities, which are where economic power is, it's where political power is, it's where um, cultural power is. Right. I was just going to say, right, what percentage of new newsrooms or uh, government faculty departments, right, even come close to 20, that 20 percent measure. But but even returning to institutions, I, I, I'll confess I was actually surprised when I did the numbers. The advantage, right, e even if we are just to like think it like any numerical advantage is directly attributable to direct influence, right? That means influence is greater. Often when we think about the advantage in the electoral college, for instance, or the Senate, we think about what is the fictional majority, like what percent of America, given the malapportionment of, of Senate seats, would it take to get the fictional majority? And for throughout the 20th century, it's been about 17%, 19% of Americans. So 19% of Americans live in the 25, 26 smallest states, more or less. But that's not the same as rural. If you actually look at what percentage of those Americans live in the rural parts of that state, it's only 30%. So, you know, rural America is small, but it's also spread out. In fact, a majority of rural Americans live in states that are underrepresented in the Senate. So I think this, I think even just the institutional question mm. of whether or not they have outsized influence, like even whether or not this corrective, this institutional corrective, which may be normatively desirable, whether that exists or not, I, I, I think the, the story is more complicated. There's only 63 house districts, about 14% of house districts that are majority rural. It's really easy to carve up rural people into different districts. So a majority of rural people are not living in districts where they constitute a majority. Now we know with other groups in society that having that sort of districting, deliberate districting to give them a majority is important for representation not only on descriptive grounds of feeling that somebody like me mm -hmm. is getting elected, but also for policy grounds. So I think there's reasons, there's good reasons, both at the constitutional institutional level to think about why our institutions aren't always responsive to this segment of the electorate. In addition, uh, and we, we go into great length on this in the conclusion, in addition to all the non-governmental institutions that, that, do not even approximate this 20% rural block. And I think that, that, that I just want to come back and emphasize that one point that you were just saying about the fictional majority, which is we will often see in political punditry states described as rural. Those are the rural states, right? But your point, I think, is really important in that while those states may you know, have a certain percentage of their population as rural, like m the majority of the people in those states actually are living in metros or in in small cities. And um, and I think that's also one of the problems when we also talk about, you know, because we see a lot of financial analyses, and you talk a little bit about this in the book as well, where rural states uh, benefit to a greater degree with fed, from federal transfers. Um, and people kind of assume that if more money is going into a particular state, that might be more rural, like in Kentucky, that all of that money is actually getting to those rural people. Um, where just like in the voting that you just talked about, I think the money is the same way. It's not necessarily the case that even if a state is the beneficiary of that money that rural communities are the ultimate beneficiary of that money um right I, and, and and to be clear tony this is the first time i've ever heard you use the word or the phrase rural state right and i, and I think for good reason like if there's you know if i if i can play with my hobby horse for a second like that is a phrase that we should just put out to pasture <laughs> 
it it has no analytical value it's um it's not a thing that's helpful for for talking about these issues there are just four states in america that have a majority rural population and they comprise less than five percent of rural america right uh maine being one of them right vermont west virginia and, and mississippi so and yet how many times do we open up the newspaper or even a report and see this phrase rural states? I think for a good reason, one, and, and you know, this is getting to the difficulty in answering or sorting out and why we argue so fiercely over this question of, of geographic distribution of resources. You know, I think I think we're often forced, we shouldn't because it leads to bad conclusions, but people wanting to answer this question are often forced to rely on that faulty heuristic of rural states because we just, we have a lot, we don't have a lot of great data on, <laughs> on where money goes. Um, the government's own reporting of where its money goes <laughs> is often different from source to source. So, you know, we, we've chatted a little bit about, Tony, uh, allocating expenditures below the state level, actually even to the states, but below the state level is, is really difficult. Um, and so, yeah, even, even Nobel winning economists are often forced to talk about rural states and who gets what, even though we know that within those states, rural communities may be the least likely to get it. So I don't want to go too far down this particular rabbit trail, but uh, when we think about individual at the individual level rather than the state or even the community level, uh, an awful lot of money gets transferred to people living in rural areas, to individuals living in rural areas because they are poorer, uh, they have uh, less access to health insurance, say, or they more elderly uh, or higher percentage of elderly population. So programs like Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare are meant in some ways to help compensate for the differences of people living outside major metropolitan areas. Which, I, we, need, we do need a different vocabulary for uh, talking about, you know, describing. In fact, we've got a question in the queue about, like, how do you define what's rural and what was what's rural today versus what was rural in the past? Anyway, that's also part of the equation here, yeah. is uh, when we talk about the sort of transfer of wealth from uh urban America to non-urban America. We're not just talking about federal grants. We're talking about money flowing from uh, the federal government to individuals. Yeah, and I, I uh, with all candor, I'd, I'd sort of love to hear what you think and what other people think. I mean, in my, my sense is that it's actually unfair to include those types of payments in a discussion of geographic wealth transfer. Because grandma receiving her social security check can get up and leave rural America and still get that social security check, which means that those types of means assistance or entitlement programs, those are not rural monies, even if they are flowing into rural areas. Um, that's not a that's not, in my opinion, so much about geographic inequality or or giving money to where people are, but who people are mm -hmm. and you know this comes back i think to the motivating line of questions about how supposedly Im imbalances and in, in political influence may translate to imbalance in political affluence or political outcomes well if you really think that rural america has greater political influence then it should have disproportionate benefits on the things that are discretionary or con uh, or or competitive right the things where we could well, be making the decision based I mean, on ruralness or I, I i worked for many years on capitol hill and uh one vivid very vivid memory of that was the fight over a transportation bill yeah. uh and the allocation of resources to states um and uh based on on population and the fight every single time is over that that bill when I was there 
went through was the donor states versus the receiver states. The donor states are the ones who pay the taxes on their gasoline that fund the building of highways in rural, predominantly, uh, or less populated states. So uh, New York puts a whole lot more money in, in terms of highway dollars than they get back. Whereas North Dakota, you know, gets vastly more than they, they put in because they have to build highways covering enormous geographic um, uh, spaces. So I'm not sure that it's necessarily true that, uh, uh, anyway, that it, I know that we're making a distinction here between individual level transfers and state level transfers in that, but I, but I think the point that you were making was that we're not accounting for this properly. I'll tell you that that is not that is not the way it is perceived among our elected officials who are scrapping for every dime that they can get for their states. Oh, I'm 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 sure it's it's not. The type of spending you describe is exactly the type of spending that I think should be in our calculation, right? Mm -hmm. And no doubt when it comes to things like uh spending on on roads, right? There's there's a rural advantage. There's just more roads to pave, and it doesn't even come close to making up for the mega highways. Mm -hmm. You know, at the but I, I think it needs to be. We need some systematic way to balance it out because, you know, there is no massive water treatment and sewage infrastructure program in rural America, right? Because most of us are taking care of it on ourselves. Not you know, there mm -hmm. there are programs and, and famously we we know about this instance down in Lowndes County where the federal government is coming in and actually building septic tanks for people that have not had them but I, I, again I, I think there are there are urban programs there are rural programs there is geographic assistance that is a part of federal revenues that's different from this means tested or, or entitlement program and I think you have to distinguish that Mm -hmm. And I would say just, you know, so I'm more than, you know, I think we're, we, that's the first step. And given all the other data points, we still haven't gone farther, I think, adequately beyond that first step. I would say there's also reason to be suspicious that rural America would benefit in the current federal spending regime, which is highly dependent on grant making, right? If about 20% of your federal revenues are going to other governments to spend for you, and the bulk of that is going through a process where those governments need to apply for assistance, what type of governments are going to be more likely to receive that independent of the criteria and qualifications put on them? A absolutely. And that's certainly true uh, in the non in the in the nonprofit domain as well, right? You know, highly developed, experienced, larger organizations have an enormous competitive advantage um, over smaller, less developed, less less well-funded organizations applying for federal. The town next door to me, the town next door to me has a clerk that works part-time. In addition to just keeping government afloat, you think she has time to go through a very laborious federal grant process. Oh, yeah, no, of course yeah. not. Of course not. Um, could I could I suggest that we shift because I, I do think there's a danger in this conversation to over index economics. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and under under index other factors. So I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about the the cleavages. Um, I mean, you you talked about this about how uh, politicians have in the past maybe in the present, have, uh, you know, severed what could have been connections between urban and rural voters around questions of development and fairness and so on. Uh, and I assume, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I assume that the, the mechanism for severing that connection has been around questions of culture, uh, religion, uh, uh, you know, social uh, differences and social preferences and so on. So talk a little bit in that vein. Yeah, I like I like your summary. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
I, I wish I could have said it so 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 clear in, in the book. I mean, I'll pick up on the two that you you touched on um, in, in, in posing the question, right? Certainly, there is a, a racial component to all of this, right? And this is a part of the. There's multiple explanations and not just one. Um, you know, for the record, it's it's an entire chapter in the book. There's perhaps just as many questions about racial attitudes and racial animus or racial resentment as there are about economic dislocation, right? All of these, you know, I when I talk about grants and aid, I get, I'm a partisan because I'm very passionate. But we went into this book quite inductively, right? There are multiple hypotheses. And one of them could very well have been that, you know, th this alone is the single sort of thing that distinguishes rural America. Um, we we don't find that. We, we don't find that it's non-existent. And our conclusion about race in rural America is ultimately that, you know, racial resentment, racial prejudice is a rural problem as it is a suburban problem, as it is an urban problem, right? It is a cleavage in American society that has no geographic distinction. Um, and yet it is absolutely something that anybody running for office in rural America, anybody that's trying to uh, make headway in rural America has to confront. So it's, it's helpful when we're talking about a racial cleavage to remind ourselves or, or to learn, right? Like, what do we mean as scholars when we talk about race as a motivating factor? So in a survey environment, and, and that's really what, what we're doing, we're gathering thousands and thousands of survey responses, right? We never come out and just ask people like, hey, are you a racist, right? Like people, people know, some people say, yes, of course. Um, but what we what we do is is we ask them, <clears throat> you know, uh, about symbolic racial issues, beliefs about how some groups do or do not conform to typified views of what it means to be an American, sort of more or less academic jargon for stereotypes, and undeniably, unequivocally. Right, the stereotype about Black Americans not working hard enough, or black, if only Black Americans worked hard enough, they'd be just as good as other minority groups have climbed. So it is higher among white rural people than it is even among white urbanites. Right, so there is a prejudice in rural America um, that is, uh, you know, a part of rural society. We also know that that, and let me say, it's not a but or a however, just at the same time, rural Americans are also much more, statistically and substantively, much more likely to value things like hard work or believe that meritocracy is a good thing or believe that there is real social mobility in this country that people can climb the ladder. Um, and, and some of that is not just perceptual. We know from, from Rosh Jetty's work and from other data, you know, the big, big, big uh, data collection efforts on social mobility, that in some rural communities, social mobility is higher there than anywhere else in the country. And so I think really what I'm trying to deal with in, in new work and trying to make sense of this, um, is is how this this culture of hard work or sense that hard work is good enough you know sort of distorts at the national and big abstract level how the systematic and structural features of of, of racial inequality sort of don't figure into rural people's minds That's a complicated story, and that is not one that is summed up by building the wall and making Mexico pay for it. But one of those is a soundbite, and the other is not, <laughs> which is why rural people are more likely to hear one and not the other. Um, religion, it, 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 it's, I think religion is, is similar insofar as the country as a whole 
is feeling the effects of changes in religiosity and, and, and really declining religiosity. We were surprised and, and you know, we shouldn't have been because other scholars have picked up on this for the last 20 years, that that decline is, is still as large in rural America as it is elsewhere. In fact, in some places, the actual um, rates of church attendance are lower than they are in suburban and rural and urban America, simply because there's no, the churches have closed. My town's seen two churches close. Hard to go to church when there's no church. Um, I, I, and I think some of the, some of the, of our, our knee jerk reactions of saying that, oh, white evangelicalism is rural. Mega churches are rural. You know, we need to, again, I think just go, it's helpful to just go back to that first thing that rural America is small. You can't have a mega church in rural America, <laughs> right? Those things are everywhere. It's not just a rural phenomenon. Well, building on um, Brent's line of questioning around those cleavages, and you talked even at the very beginning about it's a combination bottom up, top down. And I think um, one of the premises or one of the hypotheses that you also look at in the book is the extent to which, uh, um, you know, media is playing a role or or there's um, intentional stories being told or intentional information uh, that actually is affecting rural voters. Um, one of your one of your chapters is around, Fox News. So talk a little bit about the uh, how sort of either both national media and even political parties are leveraging some of these differences that are more subtle than we give them credit for, but are really driving into them for their own advantages uh, in some way. Yeah. So I'll start with the, the media, and I'll sort of frame it like this. And I'll, maybe this is just a one-off study. Maybe it's deeply methodologically flawed. Like, how, how, how are you correct? Like, why does this not match up with what I read in the New York Times last week? Or what I heard on NPR when they were covering Iowa voters, right? And I that is a story of how media undercover rural America and overemphasize certain aspects of rural America. And, and I'll start with a story that seems so good, it's almost like I made it up, but you can go and find it on npr.org. In the days leading up to the 2022 midterm elections, you know, NPR wanted to know what was on the minds of rural voters. So, you know, I'm not saying that they're malevolent. I'm not saying this is a liberal conspiracy on the part of NPR. I actually think they do a good thing, right? They go out and try to talk to rural voters in Sheboygan. The reporter on air confesses that he had a very difficult time getting anybody to talk to him until he found the house with two dozen yard signs in it. And that became the focus of the story about what was on the minds of rural voters in Sheboygan. Now, reflecting on that, it's very, in a conversation about rural misrepresentation, it's very clear that, okay, that guy probably is not like the other ones. That, that guy might be thinking about politics a little bit different than the 24 people that turned that reporter away or than his neighbors. And guess what he is? This, we identify it as about 10% of the ele uh, of the rural electorate that is just so what, what scholars are increasingly calling the deeply engaged. And the deeply engaged are different from this rural voter that we've been talking about for the last hour on so many different levels. They're much more affluent. They're much more ideologically extreme. They're much more likely to follow national news. They're less likely to have concerns about the economic well-being um, than than their neighbor uh, than their neighbors. So 
you know, part of, I think, of, of this reinforcing dynamic is that, you know, God love them, journalists who are trying to make that deadline, working for meager pay, traveling to communities that they're not from and not aware of, like trying to do the right thing, but under pressure, are talking again and again and again to the wrong people. Now, the story about political parties, I think, returns us back to that that 40 year development. Oh, before we before yeah. we go to political parties, though, because we had a question from the audience. How do you see the impact of the decline of local news playing into all of that, if at all? <clears throat> so there's a, always a couple of statistics that I, I just kind of have in the back of my head that, that you know, of all the numbers, I think it's 70 charts in the book, I'm sorry. You know, it, it's like one of the ones that just burnt into my brain. And it's that rural Americans are twice as likely not to even follow national news and are twice as likely to say that when they do, the news is irrelevant to my community. You know, no doubt that is a function, not just of the decline of the local newspaper uh, and the consolidation of larger news outlets, but the hollowing out of local news desks at those important newspapers of record in the area. You know, I, 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 I fortunately, I moved from a community that had sort of a middling rural, or middling local newspaper to one that has a very vibrant one. It makes a huge difference. It, it matters for how engaged you are. It matters for what you see. Um, you know, we talk about these problems about maybe some cognitive dissonance between the federal government doing things for rural people and rural people not knowing about it. How, how are they supposed to know about it if nobody's covering it? How do most people find out about what government's doing for them? Right? It's through media. But if media aren't covering these types of things, and I hardly think, and all I, you know, some people have said, well, social media, town Facebook groups, these have these have filled an important hole. Don't get me wrong. I, I love what's reading on the minds of my Vassalboro neighbors, and it is actually a source of news for me, but it's not that type of news. It's not political news. So, you know, it 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 might lead some people to the extremes, right? That's, I think, a story you could tell about filling the void. More often than not, I think, what, well, I don't think, what do we see happening in rural America is people are just tuning out. Right, that disaffection is as big of a problem as sort of radicalization. All right, that's that's helpful. Um, so now back to the political parties. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about the political parties? Because I mean, well, let's let's just talk about like how how um, has there what what role has kind of the political the nationalization of our politics played in exacerbating cleavages let's put it that way yeah well i think this goes hand in hand with political nationalization right the decline of candidates that might have a a home style as, as famous political scientist dick finna once said or or local roots no doubt there are candidates that still have that, um, and no doubt it still matters. You, you see sort of glimpses of that sort of old style of politicking every now and then. It's not a surprise that you see it pop up more frequently in rural parts, right, where somebody's local roots or connections to that local community matters. Right? In, in 2020, we had a race against the longtime senator, not just from Maine, but from Northern Maine, Caribou, Maine, Susan Collins, um, and a person that moved to the state from Boston. It, it We know it mattered. We know it mattered in the minds of, of people. It made the difference uh, among uh, 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 some rural Americans and, and tilted the race in her favor. But that is the exception that proves the rule. That is the only, this is the only state in the last two elections that is sent a senator from the different party as the president they've selected, right? So that decline in split ticket voting is a part of this nationalization that you're describing, Tony. 
that nationalization has organizational consequences, right? It, and it feeds back into itself, right? As the electorate nationalizes, it becomes much more, quote unquote, profitable for party organizations to run national messages. It becomes much more likely to be responsive to donors and interest groups that are thinking about politics at a national level. And to return to, the, I think, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I forget if I actually made this point at the beginning, right? Like, oh yeah, I did when I said I'm not going to speak on behalf of rural people because think about how those dynamics play out in among a group of people that care very deeply about the specific community that they, they, they live in, right? Your Our politics, our national politics is devoid of a sense of place. And yet this is the group of Americans that have mm. the most pronounced sense of place, right? So that that leads again to this systematic distrust i'm not saying that donald trump ran a campaign that was attentive to place or any less nationalist in its overtone than than uh democrats but that shows how the the system of how we conduct politics is so it's not delivering what people want and and, and it's 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 leading to distrust concerns polarization this goes to a version of several questions that have been submitted by the audience uh, uh, and um I, I think it's it's kind of like um, almost like dating advice between rural voters and non and and urban uh, or People living in metropolitan areas and people not in non-metropolitan areas, and how they there's such difficulty in communication, uh, and um, this is uh, I think beyond the scope of your actual expertise. But since several people have asked it, I feel an obligation to ask it. And people want to know, like, what's the what's the what's the secret sauce here? for being able to effectively speak across uh, to people uh, to people who have a fundamentally different understanding of the world. Probably, if you're correct, it's probably in this place, mm -hmm. around this place, it, it emerges out of this very, the difference between the, uh, uh, the very rooted people in non-metropolitan, living in non-metropolitan areas and the, and complete rootlessness of, or substantially completely rootless uh, metropolitan dweller. Um, but th this is a question that's a, a version of which has been submitted by three different peoples. How do we, how do we do that? How do we effectively communicate across that difference? Uh, and how do we do that without, uh, as one of the questioners um, put it, without othering each other? turning each other into the the enemy. Yeah, I, I wish somebody knew that answer. <laughs> I, I mean give it a I, shot. I, give it your best I, shot. I, I know, I know. And and you silly me, you know, I've only been asked that question how many times? <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah, I, we don't take a cop out in the book. We we think seriously uh, about it. But like if that answer was if that question was easy to answer, there would be no divide, right? There would be no book. Um, you know, Brent, I, I I think you actually said something important in describing this divide, which is, you know, it's possible that people are just going to think differently about like what what constitutes the good life, like what we value in life, and we want to live that. And so a lot of this without getting too philosophical, right? a lot of this touches upon whether or not Americans are even willing to value basic tenets of pluralism in our society, right? live together in disagreement, how much we will allow each other to disagree. The nationalization of our politics undermines that each and every second. Um, and that's very troublesome and very worrying for me. I don't know how to solve that. Um, We've been trying to solve that problem for many thousands of years. Like that, that is a concern to me. Um, you know, at the margins, 
you know, you celebrate the, you celebrate the small things that people are doing well. Right. Uh, you know, I think about, yeah. So I think about some of the bias, you know, the institutional biases we were speaking about earlier. And while we just harped on the media, no doubt one of those is in higher education as well. You know, rural, rural high, high schoolers graduating from you know, young people graduating from high school in rural communities are less likely to go to college. They're less likely to go to college, not because they are necessarily underprepared to go to college, but because they do not benefit from the same outreach efforts as, uh, as other communities, and they face a particular difficulty in leaving their rural community to go to college. So what have, you know, let's celebrate one of the small things. Again, all of this is going to be big change that takes place on the margins, right? Let's celebrate the fact that colleges in the last really three years, right, have said like, hmm, maybe this is actually a group that we need to include into our understanding of uh, diverse student populations and actually create networks for reaching out, you know? That, that's something that I'm very proud that my institution has started, but it it just started, mm -hmm. right? Um, so let me, uh, let me ask you a little bit broader uh, political science question. I mean, do you see the potential for our federal structure to be part of the solution here? We've talked about the problem of nationalizing. We've got, to, we've over-nationalized our politics, but we actually have a constitutional system that uh, you know elevates uh, the notion that the states are where the game should be. Um, uh, what do you what do you think? Are we too addicted to the you know everybody's got to agree with me problem? Uh, the people in uh, people in Boston want the people in Oklahoma to live like them, and vice versa. Yeah, so you're asking me to speak well beyond the the book, but I'm I'm happy to indulge, yeah. and, and it does because it does raise a good point. You know, the, the, Dan and I wanted to co-author, and we wanted to co-author together because it's like a good AI Brookings marriage in a panel. <laughs> like we we don't agree on everything about you know who's 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 got it right for rural America especially when it comes down to a lot of the policy decisions. You know, I, I walked into this book as a, a student of American federalism, uh, as a student, so understanding it's, it's all of its faults. Federalism means inequality. That's what it means. But sometimes we permit those inequalities because pushing everybody to do the same thing or having the same central program has greater risk, has greater faults. Um, you know, for I've learned a lot from Tony and the work that he's done on, on the federal government's rural policy initiatives. And I think there is compelling reasons to think that, you know, maybe, maybe it's so difficult to do from a centralized level that the states need to take a greater role in this. At the same time, you know, we know at the in the state houses that the that type of politician that cares about those bread and butter issues like good governance is becoming a rare phenomenon precisely because of these nationalizing impulses, right? When your school when your local school board race comes down to the teaching of critical race theory because you heard about it from some school a thousand miles from you, right? Like th this is this is like decentralization alone does not solve that problem. But I'm simple. I, 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 you know, federalism, again, we do not have federalism because of rural mm -hmm. places. Because federalism is, you know, unitary states have rural urban divides, by the way. Um, federations, there are federations that are even more urbanized than ours. When our federation was started, it was all rural. So federalism, ipso facto, is not for rural people, but increasingly I'm, I, I'm attentive to the idea that federalism is about place. It is about communities below the national level 
and responsive to our dual loyalties. I'm from here, but I'm also an American. And it seems to me that that structure could provide a, pro a possible salve, not all the problems that I just described with standing. Well, one thing I'd offer is that, you know, I think we are also at a place where there are very few institutions, the US military might be one of the remaining ones, where people from such different geographies come together to work together in service of something larger, um, something, you know, uniquely a enterprise of the country. Um, and to the people who have asked questions about what do we do with this? How do we start to bridge this divide? Who goes first? You know, there are things popping up and it is youth actually, some of them are youthful. You know, you have things like the American Exchange Project where graduating high schoolers are going to live in either a rural or an urban area and they're, they're exchanging, they're getting to know and build relationships. Um, the American Leadership Project is, you know, placing young people in rural communities to help them get connected to broadband. I mean, there are things starting to happen. And I mean, that could be, there could be national projects where the national government actually provides some, uh, um, provides more momentum or, or wind in the sails, um, so to speak. Let me come back though to some of the issues. Well, let me ask this question. Are there particular issues, and it's it's building off a question that we got from the audience, but are there particularly rural issues that voters are responding to? For example, how important is the opioid crisis in terms of voting? Are there issues like that that we ought to be attentive to? <clears throat> At the risk of not selling more books, let me say <laughs> <laughs> that we probably, at an issues level, are making too much of the rural-urban divide. Okay. At an issues level, at a solutions level, at a political level, accounting for the, the rural difference is imperative, right? When people identify as rural, when they identify with a certain place, Right, the solutions are going to have to be particularized when that group of people are particularly susceptible to to exploitation or are vulnerable um, uh, uh, to sort of a shock from outside money. Right, we have to account for place. We have to think about the particularities of ruralness. But at 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 an issues level, so you know, fifty thousand. I always forget what level planes fly on fifty thousand or thirty thousand. But at that level. <laughs> Time and time again, you know, throughout the book, we we just find that the that rural and urban people, particularly in the lower income brackets, care about the same things. They're just as likely to have a family member directly experience drug abuse, right? Rates of of insurance health insurance are a little bit higher in rural areas but it's not like it's any more pressing on their minds healthcare might be the one that's changing the most um it, it, it from from new polling that we've done um and just the hemorrhaging of doctors now that with with just changes in our healthcare system and lots of doctors retiring and and just rural communities that were already underserved being underserved even more but you know it, it's it's tough being poor in the middle of urban America. It's tough being poor in the middle of rural America. And so even sort of on those issues that I think have gotten a lot of play as a as a rural phenomenon, right? Like the opioid crisis and you and you hear about the pill factories out in West Virginia and I forget what they 270 as that highway going out there. And of course you read JD Vance's account of drug abuse up and down Appalachia. The statistics will show you that, that that stuff is everywhere. And and rural and urban people care about it to similar degrees. So with the exception of guns, you know, with the exception of gun control, we find very few issue cleavages that are explained solely by geography. 
and and some of that again I, I i again that's not that geography's not important for issues some of that's how we ask big questions to a a national electorate about complex issues and sort of what at any one time people are thinking about a complex issue but but that you know i think that's surprising i think that's important Well, let me ask this as, as as we come toward the end of our time, let's just get current eventsy. You know, we're just through Iowa and New Hampshire. Um, you all did a survey recently, kind of an update a, a survey. What are you seeing now? Any surprises or takeaways that that you would want to comment on? Um given your most recent uh given your most the the most recent uh, surveying that you've done. Yeah, so we're we're constantly uh, updating our our findings. Academic, we were just kind of talking about this before. Academic publishing can be slow, and so we're, you know, this is this is an evolving. Uh, politics moves fast, you know. So we were out in the field in early January uh, with a nationally representative uh, oversample of rural voters, and then an uh, urban suburban for comparison. You know, I, I think there's there are sort of two things that I took away from it. I mean, one, right, it was no surprise, or, or maybe some people will find it surprising, that that rural Republicans at least are you know, supporting Donald Trump, but so are non-rural Republicans. Um, I read I read no fewer than three different pieces in the newspapers the Friday before Iowa about how Donald Trump is going to win Iowa because of rural Iowans. 70% of Donald Trump's vote in Iowa came from non-rural communities. Again, just going back to this idea that rural place, rural people are a small segment of, of the population. You know, you can't become president just by appealing to ruralness. Um, and... At the same time that that was there, that, that segment of Trump's base, what we found was, I think, a, a confirmation of what we've been talking, you know, it's been on my mind, so I've, I've sort of hinted at it throughout our conversation. A lot of disengagement or disenchantment with the way our politics is being discussed right now. Um, right at the, you know, wanted to get current events, but at the, at the risk of getting a little, like, too prescriptive right like this this message from the white house about democracy failing us um it, it's not viewed as that persuasively in rural communities uh, rural rural voters were much more likely to have economic issues at the top of their mind rural voters were especially likely to be concerned including among biden rural voters especially concerned about immigration um, democracy failing was at the bottom of their list. Mm -hmm. You know, so so that was one of the takeaways. You know, I think that speaks directly to to the current messaging. One of uh, the other takeaway, I'll, I'll just sort of end with this one. Um, you know, we sort of went out looking. I think a lot of people rightly are concerned about extremism in this election chance for violence of course a chance that you know the the loser doesn't concede and i will say i i think a lot of that has been pinned on rural america i i i, I think i know i've read but i think if i was to go out and you know at, show a bunch of january 6 demonstrators and ask people hey where in america do you think this guy came from they would say that guy came from rural america now, a geographic distribution of the indictments from January 6th says that there is no rural advantage in that. And in fact, our survey evidence seems to suggest that the sort of anti-democratic seeing your political opponents, not just as an opposition, but the, as the enemy, actually is a little bit less in rural areas. You know, that's not, again, that is not to dismiss extremism, propensities for violence, I think actually it means that we have to take seriously that those currents are running throughout American society. Um, it's very easy and I think very dangerous to pin it just on one segment of the population. 
especially the population you, you probably know the least about. Well, I have to say one takeaway that I'm getting from this conversation is, is that, that what we tend to emphasize as rural, um, uh, many of the dynamics, the political dynamics that we emphasize as coming from rural or that being primary concerns of rural are actually concerns that are shared across the electorate um, but we're in a sense overemphasizing them or pointing to rural as the standard bearer of them. Um, and yet, uh, and that loses a lot of new, that, that tend, that um, forces us to lose a lot of nuance about how we think about the people in different geographies. And I mean, I do think one of the things that, uh, now we have our work cut out for us and we we've talked about and we you know talk about how do we how do we bridge this divide i mean to me the conclusion i was reading from the end of your book was there are just different perceptions people perceive each other differently from these geographies and that is the chasm that we're going to have to bridge um uh, at least in my personal view for us to be the kind of functional democracy that we we think um, America needs to be to fulfill the potential um, that it has. Well, I I commend you uh, for for doing that work. I mean, if I might just close, I I was just lightly chastising a student talk about perceptions of the other, for um, how do I explain it quickly? They were setting up an experiment right? And their urban treatment, right? The typical urban person was an entrepreneur. <laughs> and so here, Tony, I'm listening to all your great interviews and reading all your great work and show like, you want to meet some entrepreneurs yeah. out to the countryside, right? And so uh, thank you for, for, for well, both of you for all the work uh, that you're doing. It, it, it takes a village, as <laughs> one person said. <laughs> <clears throat> well, uh, Nick Jacobs, thank you so much for being with us for this uh, this conversation. I'm very pleased with um, the uh, the quality of the analysis and the exchange going on uh, here, and the interest that we've had from uh, our audience, which is uh, significant, I think. So, uh, for those who have joined us, we want you to know that this is the first in a series uh, of indefinite length. Uh, as we continue to dive into the research, um, the, 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 the newest research in, around, uh, uh, around, we won't call them rural voters, I guess. We will call them non-metropolitan uh, Americans uh, who, uh, who have given us so much as, as a society and uh, who... Uh, we need to give back to them with our attention and our concern. So uh, again, thank you so much, uh, Nick and Tony, and look forward to seeing both of you again soon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Brent. Uh, thanks for joining us on the front porch. And uh, as Brent said, um, uh, uh, mark your calendar for February 8th. Uh, when we'll we'll be on the front porch again uh, next time at the Brookings Institution uh, with authors of The Injustice of Place. And um, Brent, I just look forward to these conversations. This has been a lot of fun today. I've learned an enormous amount. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for your scholarship. Highly recommend the book uh, if you haven't seen it, The Rural Voter. And uh, until next time.